The reason we don't have a third party is because corporations don't want to write a third check. I can't tell you how many times over the years, that's the death of the Democratic Party, that's the death of the Republican. Two years later, they come back strong, or pretty strong, or they do way better than you. Again right. and again and again, they pronounce these political parties dead. But there's only two of them, and they need each other for the, you know, the Kabuki theater. So it's like, <laughs> you, know, you know, all the idea, you know, I mean, they always talk about, oh, we need more bipartisanship. Like, you're this courageous person. So, and what you're saying is, let's take the average of manure and dung, make a big pile of it, stand on it, and say it's the moral high ground. Did you ever think about running for office? No. How come? Um, because it's every, I, because if I ever ran for office, I think there wouldn't be one person who called himself a political comic that hadn't pulled that stunt. But I mean, I've had to think about it because I've been asked to like run Green Party and stuff like that over the years. But um, I'm just, you know, a, a sniper belongs in the hills. Watkins Glen. Oh yeah. Talk to me about Watkins Glen. What do you remember from that? Well. Uh, was the band Grateful Dead and the Allman Brothers, and it was July 28th, 1973, and uh, very stormy day. The dead opened, and it just got really lousy. So we kind of went back to the tents, and I wanted to get some reefer out of the other, out of an, out of my little pup tent, and uh, this woman. Uh, young woman at the time, Brenda Fisher, uh, said, don't go out there in the rain without an umbrella. And I'm 19 years old. I have never used an umbrella. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like a boy. I never used an umbrella. I'm still walking through mud puddles at that stage. So, you know, I just, I, I finally took the umbrella just so I could go get the pot. So I go outside and it's a clear plastic umbrella. And I look up at it and there's really this horrendous uh, thunder and lightning storm, which you can actually hear the band released an album from Watkins Glen, live at Watkins Glen, and you can hear the storm on it. So it's a clear plastic uh, umbrella, you can see through it, and I just as I'm thinking, I'm like, this is like holding a lightning rod, and there's a metal tip on it, and I'm like, this is like holding a lightning, bazamp, and it, and it hits, and I can see it, but I had on boat shoes that have like rubber on them, and it, it was weird, it didn't knock me over, it kind of blew me off the ground, and then I came back down and I ran around in circles going, oh my God, I'm hit by lightning. You know, completely blowing an opportunity to start a major cult, you know, bring, <laughs> bring me all your drugs, money and women, you know, but instead I'm running around and so going like, oh my God, and then someone goes and hands me the umbrella back, and it's like from a cartoon, it's this smoking black, you know, just the wires. You know, it's literal <laughs> smoke coming out with just the wires. And uh, we were, you know, doing uh, some pretty good acid. So, yeah. So I got hit by lightning on this tripping, too. Yeah, so I got hit by lightning. And then this year, we got hit by a, I got hit by a tractor trailer. And I said to somebody, boy, I've been hit by a tractor trailer and lightning. And the, and the person said, well, you know, these things come in threes. And I went, <laughs> Let's, let's keep what the third one is a surprise. Did you ever get to meet the guys from the dead? Uh, first time I went to see the dead in, uh, in uh, Syracuse. Anyway, I, I know my way in and out of this uh, Syracuse War Memorial where they're playing. And everybody's, the concert ends and everybody heads this way. And I just say to my friends, hold on. Because I knew you could walk, we were close to this, we were close to the stage and I go, just wait, because there's this little sort of aisle and exit that's sort of right adjacent to the, the stairs. So we just wait, you know, five, and we're sitting around, there's no rush. Everybody's in a big throng trying to get out of here, and I go, okay, come on now. And we go out, and I, I'm, I'm leading the way, so I show them the door, and I open the door, and it opens this way. And, I, and right from the stage side, the door opens that way. And I, and, and, I'm turning and going right, and the person coming out is turning left. A guy with a guitar case and a beard and curly hair. It's, it was like, you got Garcia all over my Crimmins. You got Crimmins all And both, I mean, we, I, I felt like a real kindred spirit with him because uh, we were both really concerned about the other guy, and then we were smiling and laughing and, you know, you okay? And then he took off. And uh, so, no, I, ne I never... Uh, 
I never really ran into them much, but I was around their stuff some. I got backstage at a Garcia show in uh, San Francisco in 77, and that made me think, oh, this is fun. Right before Jerry died, I was in touch with them because I had become very concerned about all the kind of throwaway kids that were kind of traveling around with the band. And, you know, I was hearing from people that had been, you know, some kids, you know, hey, you want to ride to the next event, you know, and I wanted to help try to create some sort of safe space. And I was through an intermediary and we were ready, you know, we were going to sit down and talk about it. And then Jerry died, so nothing ever came about. So, but they were very, they were open to it, you know, or, or the, the person we were in touch with, I believe well, was Rock Scully, but I don't quote me on that. What was it about these kids that, that kind of touched you? What did you see in them? Well, I mean, you just see them. They're vulnerable. They want a ticket. They want this. They want to get some pot or whatever it is. It's like, yeah, come on in my car. I'm, you know, and there were some older, creepy people around, and I'm just sort of attuned to that. Is there anybody today who's speaking to the concerns of today that you think resonates? Oh, I think a lot of them do. And, you know, I don't you know. My, my buddy Sage Francis is a hip-hop guy is hilarious yeah. we, he works with uh b dolan their show in edinburgh was amazing it was like at a fringe yeah it was a combination you know it was like hip-hop infomercial hilarious send-up of consumerism and you know uh pad answers and 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 uh uh you know uh just uh motivate what? Yeah, the epic Beardman, yeah. Uh, uh, but they're great. Um, so, but I mean, you know, if I begin to even, I, I feel so bad that I forget a million people. But I, you know, music is a constant in my life. There's always something. I mean, I still listen to, I still listen to a lot of the band. I still listen to all, I mean, those three bands from that day. The Allman Brothers, I think, did some of the most advanced music, you know, for the, like, 1970, the amount, the amount of influences and you know how complex that music was compared to a lot of the and especially the, considering Dwayne was only around yeah, for a yeah, couple of years yeah, to be honest yeah, you know yeah. oh you know who else was great I worked with a bunch early in my career the first real rock star I worked with was Warren Zevon you know when he came to New England or whatever I'd, I'd do a couple shows with him and uh, and talking to him one night and I go okay I was sure I had this joke that I've been doing forever. And I was going like, I, at that point, I've been doing it like three years, it was like 30 years ago. And, uh, uh, and the joke is, if you don't love this country, you want to get out of it, because I don't want to be victimized by its foreign policy. And it's, you know, applause break a lot of most nights. And and so uh, I said, you know, Warren, I can't keep doing that. And he goes, if I have to keep singing fucking Werewolves of London, you can keep doing that goddamn joke. <laughs> so I kept doing the joke for another 30 something years. Got into a little deal where uh, I got interviewed by the the pink section. They don't have anyone. The L.A. Times was the big arts and entertainment section, and they asked me, "Have you been on Carson or Letterman?" And I hadn't been on Car Carson. I was kind of negotiating with, and I kind of I blew that. I didn't blow it. I walked away from it because they didn't want me to talk about Central America, but they were going to let me do gun control and all this other shit. I should have done it. I was an idiot, you know. Um, but they go. They go, look, Johnny can talk about the president because everyone knows him and they're comfortable. And, you know, in a way, they were right. And that was their deal, and that's fine. I, there was no hard feelings. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this guy, uh, God, I'm like on his name. He was, he was Letterman's main guy. He left him quite a while ago now. Jesus. But he would come to Boston and then see a bunch of bunch of Boston comics and he would say to me oh I, I always catch your set because I know I'm gonna see at least one great comic when I'm and there was a lot of great comics but I just had him complimenting me because well, we'll never use you because you know we have a, a, a rule flat out no politics and so uh, I just said that I just answered the question honestly two days later I get a letter from Letterman I give viewer mail <laughs> from Letterman, and he says, we have no such policy, flat out or otherwise. And I just went, ah, you know, screw that. And then Leno found out about it and tried to intercede on my part, and I just got ah, skip it. So basically, at that point, before they ended up being the 1130 shows, I had alienated both of them. One, because of this thing that literally his guy 
said that to me. I, you know, I, I could go figure out his name. Robert Morton. Robert okay. Morton. Uh, Bob Morton. And, and, you know, he said it to me. And, and, uh, uh, and all I did was quote. And, uh, and, and very well, maybe Dave didn't know about it. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, uh, but Lano tries to intercede, or says he would, and I go, ah, skip it, Jay, and screw it. You know, yeah. they're being assholes. And so, uh, you know, within two years, it became clear that I blew any chance to be on any 1130 TV show for a few decades. So, so. The, the funny thing is now is that that's all they would want is somebody to come on there and do political humor. On all these shows. Well, you know, they can call me whenever they want. Conan had me on lately. I'd like to do Colbert on some of that. It seems like a good Colbert seems like a great landing But spot. sometimes somebody, uh, you know, when they already do it themselves, they might not want you. you know? No, but I think that the, 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 the I love Colbert. I did, I did yeah. a thing with him once, and he was very gracious and yeah. complimentary. I would love to do that show. I would love to get to his audience. Really, if you do Marin's podcast these days, it's you know, five times the impact of doing a Tonight Show. It's amazing, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's your day, you know, and, and then and, oh, Dana Gould's another podcast. Yeah. Just great. You do his, and you're really hitting a strong demographic for what you do. What's your really relationship helps. with Marin these days? Are you friends or are you well, guys Well, I mean, just, you know, you I, can, I consider him a friend, yeah. but, you know, I don't see much of him. He's pretty busy being incredibly successful and... I have a tendency to shy away from, you know, my enormously successful friends. Why? Well, they've done enough for me and whatever, and he's busy. He's busy, you know. And, you know, he'd be the first one to tell you he's a weird guy, too. He's a weird guy. <laughs> yeah, in a good way. But, you know, he's busy doing what he does. When we see each other, it's nice to see him. But he's tied up. He's got a million things going on at once, and it's a big deal. I mean, same thing with Louie. Louie's an old friend of mine. He produced my... I mean, he produced a special for me, produced and directed it, and I probably spent a grand total of, you know, four hours with him. On the uh, special that Louis did? Yeah, yeah. He's busy. He flies in. He, I mean, we talk a few times, whatever, and, and then, you know, before the, sh the afternoon, we block some stuff out, and we talk a bit, and he gives me some suggestions, and I do what I can. And he was happy with the show. They did a great job editing it, and that's it. Bring me all your drugs, money, and women.